it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest expert today, who is uh, Dr. Barbara Rivera Polo, um, who is based in Barcelona. So we have international representation here. <laughs> She's um, the principal investigator at the Rare Tumors Lab and an adjunct professor at McGill University, where she did um, some work with Dr. Will uh, Fawkes uh, several years ago. And her field of research includes low-grade tumors and neuroepithelial tumors. And I know that many of us struggle when we are looking for, you know, where are the research studies focused on rare tumors? So we wanted to host this to kind of let Barbara tell us about what she's doing, but also as a segue to have someone we can refer our patients or samples to. So Barbara, take it away. Thank you. Thank you uh, to you for the kind introduction. Uh, certainly we study rare tumors, but more specifically than that, we study rare tumor syndromes. Okay. Uh, we do a lot of somatic profiling, but we Usually, or in most of the scenarios, we also investigate the German family, familial associations or cases that come to us mostly through uh, cancer genetics clinics, right? So that's how the stories in the lab appear. We don't focus in a particular tumor type. We rather the stories pop up coming usually from diagnostic clinics that where the, where the testing, the 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 diagnostics level of testing does not release a, a, a endpoint result, a pathogenic germline variant that can explain the disease. And then we tailor more or less a, a research project to those patients. And then the projects grow, grow, and, um, and, and they become then lines of research in the lab. Right, so what I'm gonna start talking today is benign tumor predisposition because we do a study many uh, syndromes where we see this confluence of both benign and malignant tumors within a family, within a cohort of patients, within a syndrome, okay? And I like to start with a picture of La Gioconda because, um, I was reading one day and, and I found out that the latest studies about La Gioconda uh, say that uh, Da Vinci painted her with this sort of big neck because she had an overgrowth of the thyroid gland. So an overgrowth of the thyroid gland in that times might have meant multinodular goiter. That is not, not a tumor, not a cancer, it is an overgrowth, right? But can predispose to cancer development. And we do study thyroid here. So uh, this is something that I'm going to be talking about. So uh, let's jump in Dyser syndrome. I'm, I'm sure that most of you are aware of this syndrome that is called Dyser is due to hereditary germ, uh, pathogenic variants or, or constitutional uh, pathogenic variants in the Dicer gene and the predisposed to the development of almost 15 different clinical manifestations, most of them benign tumors or malignant, very rare cancers or malignant, very rare tumors. In the childhood, uh, during the childhood um, phase, and even in young adults, right? The more prevalent uh, manifestation of Dicer are thyroid nodules. That's why I started with La Gioconda, because we're going to talk a lot about thyroid in this session. So thyroid nodules is the most prevalent manifestation of Dicer syndrome. Dicer syndrome has a very uh, low penetrance and diverse uh, phenotype. Who is Dicer? So Dicer is a molecule, it's a protein here in the cytoplasm of the cell that cuts precursors of a microRNA into a microRNA. So what is a microRNA? It's this uh, species of here are small uh, pieces of nucleotides, of 21 uh, nucleotides that will now be integrated in another complex called RISC. What Dicer does produce these microRNAs and, and regulates post-transcriptional the expression of genes. So it's like a concert conductor, 
right? It regulates expression of many things along the, the, the genome, right? And uh, Leanne de Koch, who is a, is a magnificent uh, now doctor, but he was a PhD student with Will Fox, and she worked a lot in, in classifying and defining many of the phenotypic manifestations of Dicer. So all these apples here are up to the 15 manifestations I talk about. And many of those manifestations are in fact benign tumors, right? In blue are either uh, multinodal goiter that are, as I said, an, an, an overgrowth of the thyroid gland. It's not a cancer, it's not a tumor, but we work a lot in the lab. Uh, they're benign, of course, cystic nephromas, pituitary blastomas, that despite being a benign tumor, they actually uh, have devastating uh, effects, clinical effects in the patients, pineoblastomas. And I highlighted here primary brain sarcomas because those are the one of the most recent manifestations discovered in Dyser syndrome. It's certainly not a benign tumor, it's a super aggressive a condition that is lethal for kids between mostly the, the, the age of six and nine. And they are becoming, they, they, they were really, really rare, only described in 2019, 2020, and they're becoming really common now. We're seeing more and more of these cases, especially, I was just coming from Mexico and Peru, especially in Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador, in that area, the incidence is becoming, uh, honestly, uh, remarkable and really uh, worrisome. And they are somehow associated to the ICER too. And in the lab, we work on this. So I, despite not being benign, I just wanted to, to mention it. So uh, this is one of the typical families. Basically, is the family one in this paper here from, from Dr. Fox and Mark and Dr. Tiskovic and, and, and Tomas Rio where they uh, they describe the first association of multinodular goiter, familial multinodular goiter, with Dicer 1 associations, right? With Dicer 1 mutations. This was 2011, and since then, the implication of Dicer germline pathogenic variants in familial uh, thyroid nodules and tumor has been just growing and growing. This is a schematic view of Dicer, right? Every of these boxes, let's think, is a domain of the protein. Right, these in green are the RNA domains that if we look in this little bulb here, are the domains that will cut, they're the scissors of the Dyson enzyme. They will cut that, that herpin, that is the precursor of the microRNA into a microRNA. Well, these other little squares on the bottom are where the germline variants can be. The, as we can see here, they are distributed along the gene. But Dicer follows a very particular model. The germline or the first hit is, is usually a truncating variant distributed anywhere along the gene. And then the second hit, Dicer works, follows a, a tumor suppression model with two hits, or at least a, a, a model with two hits. Okay, let's leave it at that. And the second hit is located the vast majority of the times here in this big cluster of squares. Every color represents a different amino acid that can be mutated in tumors, right? So this pattern is very classical. And this amino acid highly mutated here are hot spots regions, and they are actually the amino acids that link the metals that will provide the enzymatic activity of the protein, right? So as I said, two hits model. The first one is a truncated, uh, truncates one of the alleles, right, along the gene. It's usually German. It can be somatic if the tumor is sporadic, but it's also linked to Dyson. And the second hit is a hot spot, right? In rare scenarios, there are patients that they have this hot spot as a mosaic version. And those tend to be very aggressive phenotypes. And we see tons of tumors in these patients. We believe it cannot be, it's very hard that one of those is completely tolerated in the German. There might be some scenarios, we're working a little bit on that too, but generally speaking, the one that is inherited and the one that will be uh, interesting for this audience is the truncating allele. Okay, there are some exceptions, like 
almost everywhere. And pineoblastomas, that is a tumor type, also very rare, associated to dicer and to drosha, that is another microRNA uh, processor, and to DGCR8. Pineoblastomas, they seem to be the only tumor type that can tolerate a complete loss of dicer DGCR8 or drosha, meaning one allele is truncated, the other one is lost by LOH, or there's two truncated mutations. Why they, this tumor type can or, or prefers this combo, we don't know yet. Uh, but it, there's also good news about pineoblastomas associated to the microRNA processing machinery, either Dicer, Drosa, or DGCRA, that is another processor. That is, those, the subgroup of, of pineoblastomas associated, associated to these mutations has a better outcome. Uh, so, this is a family with three generations and familial multinodal coider. So this could be a very good candidate for Dicer, and so it was. However, it was Dicer negative. I work on this during my, um, my postdoc with Dr. Fox. And as you can see, there's one woman here that has also three sonomas and two ovarian desmoids, and a kid here that had been diagnosed with a choroid plexus papilloma, also a benign tumor, like sonomas, and uh, a spectrum of autism disorder. Right, and this we thought that this was just a red herring, and we perform a whole exon in uh, all the affected individuals and the non-affected, and the only variant that segregated perfectly with the disease was a variant in this gene, DGCRA. I've mentioned it a couple of times before, talking about pineoblastomas. DGCRA is also a microprocessor. This variant had never been described in the German before 2020. DGCR8 is a microprocessor, so helps Dicer, works with Dicer, but works before Dicer in the, in the generation of microRNAs, now in the nucleus. I said before that Dicer works on the cytoplasm, DGCR8 works in the nucleus, so prepare that herping that will going to be further processed, but it's the same pathway. So if we try to imagine the same plot that we made for Dicer, these boxes here represent the amino acid, the domains of the protein of DGCR8, right? And these are the mutations. And at the bottom, the germline is our family, that family that I just plotted. And then here on the top, there is somatic mutations, and you can see a long line of somatic mutations here. So all of these in blue are Wilms tumors described to have the exact same mutation, this uh, E518 to lysine, okay, glutamate to lysine, the exact same nucleotide and protein change that our family had. But the Wilms tumors, they harbor it somatically and our family harbored on the German. There was also two uh, papillary thyroid cancers with that mutation. When we were in the process of studying this family, we saw this and we clearly had that uh, an idea that this the, was the right pathogenic variant that we should be studying deeper. So then we called the family back in the clinic, and now you can see that many of them, they have a line on green here, saying swanomas. So we ask them, we sit them around a table, like in a, one of your clinics, and we ask them, apart from having thyroid alterations, thyroid nodules, do any of you have a little bump that is painful? And absolutely every, each of them, except for this man, answer yes. They all have thyroid nodules, multinodular coided, and peripheral swanomatosis. These are the little bulbs for you to see the mutation, for, you, for also to capture in red the tumors. There was always LOH at the tumor level. You can see in blue the germline DNA with the two alleles, and then the tumor of the CPP even, there was LOH, okay? And this is the structure of what happens. So this is a, a wild type situation where this glutamic acid here, okay, this glutamic acid in the protein, this is the protein, stabilizes these bridges to the RNA. 
right? This is the, the, the a fraction of the RNA. And when we have a mutated lysine, these bridges are broken. So the stabilization that will help the cutting is broken. Therefore, the processing of the microRNAs might not be happening properly. But who else is DGCRA? DGCRA is located in chromosome 22 Q11, right beside LCTR1, SMARB1, and NF2. Our favorite genes in schwannomatosis development is one of the genes located in 22 Q, and it might be one of the genes that we've been suspecting might have been underlying certain types of schwannomatosis. So here we saw the, the molecular link to the schwannomas, and we pulled that thread and we kept working on this. So the accepted model of schwannomatosis, you will start with a, a German uh, pathogenic variant or a mutation one here with a SMARB1 or LCTR1, and then you have a second hit that it tends to be a loss of the secondary allele, right? An LOH that will also delete NF2 in the second allele. And then you will have a third step, a third mutation. And somatically, NF2 gets a second hit now on the same allele that carries the germline SMARB1 variant. So this is the two, three, four hits story. Okay, it's the same for LCTR1, but because LCTR1 has a SMARB1 in the middle of NF2, if we go LCTR1 first hit and then we delete the entire 22Q because of the structure of 22, you will be losing three of these tumor suppressor genes favorite for sonoma, and then you mutate back NF2. So you have a total of five hits, right? So we look at what was happening somatically in our tumors. So this is a genome-wide plot. Each of these alternate color lines is a chromosome, and every dot is a little snip. So we can build this genome representation. So here we will say German of individual one, right? Swanoma of individual one, swan, uh, German of individual two, and her four swanomas. Again, German of individual three and one CPP, etc and Wolf's tumors and PTCs. And then in blue is the German chromosome 22, here on the right with me. And then in red, as we can see, these dots have spread out through the chromosome. That means that there is an allelic imbalance. There is a loss of one of allele because if they are heterozygous, the dots should be in the middle of the graph. Like for the German, we're only plotting heterozygous SNPs here in these multi-dots, very, very condensed. Okay, if someone is not following me, I can go over this. But this, you can see that they all, all swanomas in DGCR8 and also the CPP and the PTCs and the Wills tumor, they lose the chromosome 22, right? So we're, we're starting to see the German E518 germline or somatic in the Wolf's tumor, and then the secondary heat is a loss. So now the model is inverse to Dicer. In Dicer, I told you, germline, you start with a truncated, and then the secondary, the, the, the second, the somatic heat, is a missense. Here, we start with a missense hot spot, and the second is a loss of the gene because it's encompassed with 22Q, okay? But one missense, one loss is sort of the same model. We sequenced many swanomas, we sequenced many thyroid cancers, and we didn't find much. And then one day I was moving to Barcelona and I said, hold on a minute. I sat at that table and I sit at that family and most of them, six out of seven, had MNG and swanoma. Let's query the combo. And we, I went to the Institute Catalan of Oncology Clinical Diagnostic Database and I queried the combo, peripheral sonomatosis and thyroid tumors. And this man here showed up with a PTC at the age of 23, an MNG, renal cysts at 33, and seven sonomas since the age of 12. And I sequenced him. And what happened? He had the exact same mutation the exact same variant, germline pathogenic variant in the same gene, same phenotype, same variant. This is a very rare 
but it happens and it is repeated. And then we started the investigation again. He was in a normal case. His parents were not affected. His sister had a giant cell tendon. She had two more. And I was like, oh my God, another phenotype. But no, she was not affected. And uh, we published this and the tumors follow the same exact same model and they had uh, LOH somatically. And we we're trying to build the same, the same uh, a tree with the apples. We know it causes multinodular goiter, sonomatosis, PTC. We now have a new third case that appears in the sick kids in Toronto. Uh, it's a kid with MNG and a micro PTC, same germline mutation, same secondary hit. We don't know if he he's not being following for sonomatosis, so I cannot know. We know that somatically this gene causes Wells tumors. We know that somatically it can cause pineoblastomas through a complete loss. And we do not know about the kinesis or the DeGeorge syndrome that might be a new manifestation. And we have recently included the gene as a new syndrome here in the classification, in the fifth classification of the WHO by the IARC in the genetic tumor syndromes. It's still in beta version. You cannot find this, but you could find it online. It's going to appear there under the name of microRNA processor tumor predisposition syndrome. Okay, so we're going to recognize it soon. It's going to be recognized. We're very happy about this because it will give awareness. And how is the path to sonomatosis in DGCRA? Well, if we keep in mind the model that I explained you, and now we have another gene that is Afsinophel CTR1. That is our first step. Our second step, we lost 22Q, so we lost four new tumor suppressors. And then we have seen intense sonomas. They mutate NF2, and four of them, they don't. So it can actually produce sonomatosis just by uh, mutating uh, DGCRA, you know, in the two alleles and complete loss of NF2. And in, in those sonomas, we could even run a Western blood. This is Merlin protein. This is the band for Merlin, which is actually NF2. So you can see that we can, despite um, it's wild type, there's no mutation and we produce a protein. So we know that NF2 is intact in at least some of the sonomas. We we're working on finding more cases with, with uh, uh, sorry, before I go to that, um, what are the consequences of this? So when you have a, a defective process of microRNA, what happens is that you're not silencing transcripts. So some of your transcripts are going up, right? So we check what transcripts were going up in some of those sonomas, and they're related to the RAS pathway. And it is true that the RAS pathway has linked, been linked to uh, all the sonomas before by having mutations in RAS or in BRAF, but also from LCTR1 because the uh, epigenetic, uh, genomic, and transcriptome landscape of sonomatosis has, has shown that LCTR1 sonomas might also upregulate RAS pathway, and they might be linked to RAS. So now we're digging into these mechanistics and, and studying and comparing LCTR1 profiling with DCRA profiling through, for example, methylation. As you can see, there's a methylation plot. I don't want to go much in details about this. These are all sonomas. Uh, that due to LCTR1 or SMARTV1, they tend to all go together. For you to know that it's not the gene what is uh, driving, we can also see SMARTV1 mutated tumors here. For example, these are ADRTs that are SMARTV1 mutated and they're malignant and they're, they cluster together and normal brain cluster and sonomas, they all spread depending on many things, but these here they are there with the, with the sonomas, okay? Um, so we're working to find more uh, DGCR8 mutated syndromes or pheno sorry cases or phenotypes with uh, Douglas Store through a big uh, study that he's performing in in the Gaysinger and the UK Biobank, and uh, I'm asking uh, labs and 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 bringing awareness of the syndrome. So if you do uh, come along one of the carriers or you come along one of these phenotypic conundrums with thyroid and sonomatosis, please get in touch because we might have a, a project to, to work on together. Are there other sonomatosis genes? Because we found one, but are there more? Well, and it's a very recent case uh, that Fiona, which is our PhD student uh, with well folks in, in McGill, work in this family that had uh, the proven had a sonoma 
and her, her mom had five peripheral sonomas and one glioblastoma and the dad had a malignant MPNST and what they had was not a smart B1 or LCTR1 or DCRA. What he had was actually, what she had was actually smart K4, smart K4, pathogenic, nothing in the ovaries. Uh, this has been published and you can, you know, go and dig. So there are more sonomatosis genes out there. There might be scars and rare, but there are more. So I want to finish with that. Uh, this is our lab, uh, but as a summary, uh, DICID and DGCRA cause both benign and malignant tumors. DGCRA is a new syndrome causing benign tumors. And there are new genes that actually cause uh, sonomatosis that what is, a, is a common uh, syndrome with or manifestation with benign tumors. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was just fascinating.